So you might be wondering what I have behind me here. Now I've done several videos on these particular cars. In fact, one of them you've seen in a few videos, but I thought it'd be fun to do another one. So this is an R53 buyer's guide. So you've heard me correctly. This is an R53 Mini Cooper buyer's guide. What I have behind me are two 2006 Mini Cooper S's, except this one is actually a John Cooper Works while well, this one is, in fact, a Cooper S. Now, don't let the looks of the cars deceive you. This one is actually newer by one month. This was recently purchased by the owner of this car. I think this is his fourth Mini that he's purchased. So he has a lot of Minis now, and I'm incredibly jealous here because I wish I had two minis right now but unfortunately I only have one so we're gonna go over both of these cars go over what to look for when you're buying an R53 mini because the R53 is becoming a very rare vehicle and it's becoming very difficult to find especially ones in fantastic condition or just really really nice examples this one aside from a few things that have gone on with it that it might need a little bit of TLC Otherwise, it's a fantastic little vehicle, and we're going to go over everything that you should look for when you're buying an R53 Mini Cooper S. So, I figured the best place to start would be under the bonnet of this car. Now, as you can see right here, panning across the front of it, there's a lot of rock chips. Now, this is a known issue with the first-gen Minis, because as some people like to say, the first-gen Minis had the aerodynamic characteristics of a brick. And it looks like it's been hit by a couple. But we're going to actually pop the bonnet here and actually check the engine and what to look for under the engine. Now I'm going to have the owner of the car hold the bonnet up because as you can see, these pistons need to be replaced. That's one thing that I thought you all should know that you might actually have to replace these because they are known to fail. And as you can see, it becomes a fun game of uh, trying to keep the hood up while you're under the car. So I'm going to have the owner here hold this up. Now, as you can see, we are dealing with the 1.6 liter Tritec supercharged motor, putting out about 162 horsepower stock and about 165 foot-pounds of torque. So pretty peppy little motor. The superchargers in these are fantastic. The 2005 to 2006 model years actually had Teflon coated impellers in the superchargers. So they were some of the best ones. And in fact, if you're going to buy a first gen mini and you're going to go for the Cooper S model, I would look for 2005, 2006 examples as they are probably some of the best ones out there. That being said, another great model year for the first gen mini was the 2002 model year in the US as it was the one where everything was just really well put together. But as you can see here, nothing really unusual. It's a nice little motor. It looks like it's in fantastic shape now. There are a few things under here that make me question maybe some things were done, maybe some things were changed. For example, the battery terminal, the positive battery terminal, is actually not attached to the air box like it should be, which indicates to me that someone had replaced the air filter at some point. Now, that means that this terminal needs to be put back up here at some point, so that's something that will need to be addressed at a later date. Another thing you want to look at when you get these cars is to make sure there's no leaks coming from the coolant expansion tank. That is a known fault area, and I actually had to replace the one in my first Mini, my R53, so I know what that's like. Now, as you can see here, we have the strut towers on the car. Now, this one in particular has actually mushroomed and torn. Now, what that means is the metal right here has actually bulged upward and the mount inside of this has actually torn around it. So this is going to need a new strut mount. Now, if you're going to replace one strut mount, you might as well replace both of them. And I have extensive experience at doing this. I've replaced the strut mounts in my R53 at least three or four times before I finally replaced them with fixed camber plates. Now, that's not exactly something you should do or unless you really want to, but what I would do is probably get a new OEM mount for both sides install those they're not that difficult to do if you really pay attention and you're careful and then what i would do is i would go to either craven speed or m7 tuning and i would get what they call the strut tower defenders now what those are is they are thick metal plates that mount on top of your strut towers on both sides and what it does is it compresses the metal back down and it keeps the mushrooming from occurring when you hit bumps or 
potholes, which is why you really should avoid potholes at all costs with these cars. Now, the owner of both of these cars has the M7 version of the Strut Tower Defenders on his green John Cooper Works, so he knows from experience that you want to have the Strut Tower Defenders on the car. I would encourage you to possibly go for the Craven Speed ones, as the metal plate is a little thicker, but the M7 makes a fantastic one as well. As far as any other things to look for under the engine bay, I would definitely take a look at your engine mount. If you have a 2005-2006 Mini Cooper S, or even a Mini Cooper, you probably have this canister engine mount. Now what this is, it's filled with oil and it's rubberized and it provides a much smoother ride because people complained about the fact that the 2002-2004 to models were too harsh. Unfortunately, that also resulted, by making the stuff softer, it resulted in the mushrooming of the strut towers because they made the suspension a little softer, as opposed to keeping it stiff like it should have been. So you'll notice right here on the frame rail that there are some oil spots. Now that's because this is probably seeped at one point and has been since replaced. These are definitely things to look at. Now if you're going to do some serious racing, you could replace this with a polyurethane engine mount, but if you're going to just do around town driving, the regular stock canister engine mount works just fine. Now you also might want to, if you're going to do this, you might think, well maybe I should replace the ignition coil. Let me tell you something. The stock ignition coil works just fine. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. So I wouldn't replace the ignition coil on this car with an aftermarket one. I would put, I would keep the stock ignition coil in the car. It does the job, it does everything it needs to do. Now, while the bonnet is up, we can also look for possible rust. Now, you don't usually find rust in the engine bay, and if you do get it taken care of, it might often be just surface rust. Another thing you wanna look at is the front bumper. Now, you'll notice these two screws right here. That is part of the hanging process to hang the bumper on the car. Now, you can tell what shop has worked on the car and if it was a certified mini shop you can tell that if it was done correctly because these screws if they've been removed have often been replaced with bolts and if it was done correctly you're not going to see any cracks along the tops of the plastic here because it's very thin often some shops who don't have experience with mini coopers will actually torque down that bolt or screw and in the process crack the plastic which is a terrible thing really messes things up under the bonnet for you but I think this one looks like it's been taken care of by a mini dealership, so it doesn't look like it's in terrible shape under here. It also still has the original core support, which is very nice to see with the original warning labels, and everything looks like it's in relatively good shape under here. So I don't see anything too concerning under here at this point in time, apart from getting the strut mounts replaced, getting the strut tower fixed, and getting that battery positive terminal addressed over there on that side and just get it back where it needs to be. So there's really nothing under here aside from also possibly replacing the struts for the bonnet that you really need to worry about. So we can turn our attentions on to other aspects of this car. Another spot to look for rust would be on the back of your R53. Now, this doesn't look terrible, and in fact, there is actually no rust on the back of this car, but one of the places you want to actually check is around the taillights, as they tended to hold water, and in some instances, get little rust bubbles around them. This one doesn't look like it's ever had any rust back here, so that's a good sign, and I don't see any rust right here either. Another place you'd want to look is around the corner with the gas cap. Now, if your car is, I think, 10 to 12 years old, or it's less than 10 to 12 years old and it's a mini, you have a unlimited mileage rust warranty which covers rust repairs. Now what they actually do, and I had this happen with my R53 when I sold it, is they had to replace this quarter panel because there was a rust bubble under the, under the gas cap. Now you might think that seems like a little bit of overkill, but here's how mini justifies this. Rather than patch the spot where there's rust, they feel it's better and probably safer to just replace the entire panel. So that's what they do. They will take the whole panel off and put a brand new panel on the car. And now you have an entire new panel with no rust issues whatsoever. And there's no risk of it ever returning. So that's something to take into consideration if you're going to look for one of these examples. If you're okay with something having a little bit of rust and you can do those repairs, I would encourage you to go ahead and do that. Otherwise, try to find a rust-free example. I know they're kind of hard to find, but definitely look. Now, some of the places that you need to look, obviously, as I stated, around the taillights, around the gas cap, and there's one more place you actually need to look for rust. That other place is the door jam of the car. Now, the way to check this is to grab the weather stripping and pull it up. 
And as you can see in this one, there's a little bit of surface rust right here. This is a known thing with most R53 and R50 Mini Coopers. If it's surface rust, just sand it down a little bit, put a little primer on it, and you should be good to go. Also, just keep it clean. As you can see, it's very dirty right here, so it does trap water. You want to make sure that you keep this clean, relatively water-free, and just check it periodically, make sure there's no rust issues there. So otherwise, this isn't terrible. This is actually in pretty good shape. Now, if this car had a sunroof, I would also check the rain gutters as that's an, another area that's prone to rust and water issues. And you might end up with water in your footwell, oddly of all places, because of how it drains out of the roof. So definitely things to look at when you're purchasing one of these cars, but otherwise there shouldn't be any serious issues with one of these if you just know where to look for rust and where to uh, check for things. Now another thing you need to look at is the suspension on your Mini. Now obviously I mentioned the strut bushings, but there's another spot you need to look and that is your control arm bushings. Basically you want to check to make sure there's no forward and backward play on the wheel. If there is, that could be an indication that your control arm bushings are failing and they need to be replaced. It is a known issue with the R53 and it's not usually that difficult to get done. I would recommend if you're going to replace them yourself that you get jack stands, you know how to align things, and you go slowly. You're going to have to drop the subframe to do it and that's a bit time consuming and you probably want to get bushings that are pre-pressed already installed into other control arms and then just return these as a core deposit. So definitely something to take into consideration, but otherwise not something to be too concerned about. Just make sure that there's not any real play. Now this one has a little bit of play, but that could be from the failed strut mount on the top, but it could also be control arm bushing. So it's something I would definitely take into consideration when you bring the car in and have it inspected by your certified technician. Just make sure that this stuff is looked at and get an estimate for what that repair would cost. So, now that we've gone around the exterior of the vehicle, I thought it would be a good idea to go for a test drive. Now, I have the owner of the vehicle with me for liability reasons. So, we're going to go ahead and start it up. And we're going to roll up the windows because it's a little chilly out. Oh, I forgot. Now, here's something interesting. The R53 did not have auto up windows. Now, you can get something called an Ian Cull switch. It's about $30 or so. Plugs into the back of the switch panel and it allows you to essentially have an auto up feature in these cars. Now, they said the reason they never did it was an anti-pinching thing because the windows didn't have a thing where it would actually detect that it's pinching the fingers of whoever happened to have their hand on the window. So don't have your hand on the window while you're uh, rolling your windows up. Now, inside the vehicle, as we can see, we have a few warning lights. We have a service engine soon light, we have a brake light, ABS light, tire pressure light. We have a lot of lights. Now, 81,000 miles, not a terrible thing. These are lights that just indicate that there might be some things that need to be taken care of. So I would probably take this car over as soon as we can and actually get it looked at and figure out what needs to be done. As far as we know, there is a vacuum leak that the owner found or an air leak somewhere in the system. And there might be a tire pressure sensor issue and there might be an ABS issue. Otherwise, everything seems relatively fine. I'm gonna flip this armrest out of the way because I hate those armrests. So otherwise, everything seems really good. I forgot how stiff the clutch was in these cars. So we are now off into the yard. Drives relatively well so far. Now, given how old the car is with all these plastics, it's a very rattly ride. Which way are we going to go? Take a ride. So far, I actually really like this little car. I've always liked the first-gen Minis. They feel very sporty. So it's kind of nice to actually get out and actually drive one for a chance. This one definitely feels like what it is, a 14-year-old car. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, it's a lot more rough than, uh, than the JCW. What puzzles me right now is when I use the turn signals, it flashes the hazard, the hazard light button. You also don't have to push the clutch in very far to shift it. It's kind of an interesting scenario. Which way are we going to go when we get up to this intersection? We'll go to the highway. We'll go take the right. Take a right. Okay, so we're going to take it out on the highway and actually open this sucker up. 
and see what it does. So far, I'm very impressed with it overall for as old a car as it is. It drives very well. It feels very, very stiff. It feels like you're driving a classic car. You do not feel like you're driving a modern stick shift vehicle. You feel like you are driving an older vehicle. And this is pretty fun. <laughs> I heard a squeak from the rear brake, so that might be an indication that it does need some brake work. Oh, I love the supercharger sound though. That's just fantastic. This is actually a very nice little car. I really like it actually. It's very nice. I could hear some noises. I can hear lots of noises. There's lots of rattling and creaking and hard plastic. That was kind of the thing with the first gen minis. They had a lot of plastic A lot of rattly plastic. It was just the way the car was. But people still love these cars, and there are people out there who g go out of their way to find a first gen Mini Cooper. Yep, they sure do. Case in point, <laughs> he went out of his way to buy a first gen Mini Cooper. Now, it definitely is a much more cramped vehicle compared to, for example, my Clubman. But otherwise, it's not a terrible little car as we shall now demonstrate as soon as we can get away from a scion in front of me okay now we're at highway speed I can definitely hear a lot of road noise coming from the rear yeah It is definitely very loud coming from the back of the car. Now that's not an indication of, that's not an indication of wheel bearings, I don't think, but it is an indication that maybe the tires are incredibly loud, which means they're probably very cheap tires. Right. But otherwise, it's not terrible. It's just, that is really noisy. Exactly. I mean, I thought my Mini was loud. That is loud. Yeah. But the acceleration is very good. It gets up and goes. It's really good that way. So I do like this. This is very, very, very nice. This is very fun. You can sure tell the difference between, though, mm -hmm. the JCW and this one. Yes. This and one. we're going to demonstrate the JCW at a later, da at a yeah. later date. But it's definitely loud in here by comparison which is indicative to me that there's something going on but I think it's that the uh, tires are cheap and noisy more than anything so I'm going to pull off and turn around and we'll race back the other way I do think that the brakes might need some work yep. because the slowing down wasn't exactly ideal it was kind of a little um is it going to slow down is it not going to slow down please slow down so that's something to be concerned about if you want to get that looked at. So that's something to definitely check out. But we're going to go ahead and turn around right here. This is an intersection that needs a traffic light. Yeah, it does. This needs a traffic light. I'd be interested to see what you think on the acceleration between this one and the other one. Because I know you've driven it too. Yeah. Stealing. Up oh, here comes a Prius. <laughs> oh my gosh, he actually went for it. <laughs> oh, that yeah. exhaust. I gotta roll the window down. Oh, I gotta yeah. hear that. That's that's sound by choice. Oh gosh. <laughs> what I loved about these first gen minis is they popped and burbled on their own. You didn't have to provoke it. Yeah. Oh, no. no, I don't. <laughs> I could, I could just sit here and listen to that all day. It's music. It's music. It's music. It's music, and I love it. So what exactly possessed you to buy this car? Well, uh, my JCW is a 2006, and when I bought it, as you put on your channel, it had 26,000 miles on it. I've only put 
about 1,800 miles on it since I bought it two years ago, and it's it's pretty much perfect. It's it's a great car. I want to keep the miles low, and and so I just looked at it. I didn't. I don't drive it. I just look at it, and not really, but I do drive it a little bit just to kind of keep things going. But I, I wanted something that I could have fun with as an everyday driver, or or even doing something later on on the track, something I could play with. And this one had. A little bit more miles than that, of 81,000, and um, I thought, you know, uh, I want to drive it. I want to drive something, and this is, it was, just came along at the right time. Another 2006, um, I'm, 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 I'm stuck on Gen 1s. I love them, and so we decided to go ahead for it. And awesome. No sunroof. Makes it lighter. Yep. This doesn't have a sunroof. It's a no. slick, it's a, some people call it a hard top, some people call it a slick top. It has no sunroof. So that's actually kind of desirable lately for Mini Coopers since the sunroofs on the earlier ones were prone to a little bit of leaking. So, so far I'm very impressed. It's a little noisy on the road aspect of it. You know, like you were saying, there's not too many barn finds or really good ones out there. My no. other one was just amazing. It and these minis are actually yeah. heading in that direction. They're heading in the direction they're going to be highly sought after at least the first one speaking of minis there's a convertible right over there huh. what kind of convertible is that that is a cooper that is a cooper in white silver this really is as close as you can get in a modern mini to driving a classic mini it just feels exactly the same to me which i'm sure everyone will disagree with me on but i like the feel of it it's just kind of fun. I hate those potholes. <laughs> no problem. But I love the popping from the exhaust out back. This is the generation where there was no sport button. There was no driving modes. It had only one mode and that was sport all the time. The steering wheel was always stiff feeling and responsive. The throttle was always quick and there was no turbo lag because there was no lag. It didn't it need any ever need any of that. So it was a great generation for this car. The new ones are fantastic in their own right, but the first generations were just really like raw cars. And that was what made them so great. This one's actually not in bad shape though. It's really nice inside. The shift knob's not terrible. The leather looks like it's been well well worn. The chrome trim rings here and there are actually in pretty good shape as well. I really like it. I think it's very fun. But I really want to get back on the highway and actually put it up to its speed and get a better feel for this car. So uh, we should get to that. I like the response, though. It's not... Yeah. You, you, you just can't find these every day. You know, I, no. I, I, for fun, look at Mini Coopers all the time. What's out there? What's but see, what I liked about this, even while coasting, yeah. while, while you're coasting the car... You didn't have to give it any real throttle. You kind of just let up on the clutch and it just rolled. And then you put the clutch back in and it slows down. Those are your brakes. Yeah. Yeah. It's squeaking, so it does need some it might need some brake work. And here we go. There's a supercharger. <laughs> Love that sound. The throttle response is just instantaneous yeah. with the supercharger. The thing about superchargers over turbos, turbos you get power at a certain point. Whereas superchargers, it's pretty much instantaneous. It's pretty much instant torque, instant horsepower. You hit that pedal and it is going. <laughs> I love it. Now, if I had an infinite speed limit down here, I'd be flooring it. This is just great. This is the way minis are meant to be. I think all minis are fantastic, but there is something about the first gen minis that just, they were iconic. They're iconic little vehicles, and I still think they're just as iconic. 
I still think they're fantastic little cars. And I still think people should drive one. If you're going to buy a Mini and you're going to own a Mini at some point in your life, you have to, at some point, drive a first-gen Mini. Even if you don't end up buying one, you have to drive one because there is something about the experience of driving a first-generation Mini. It just feels very... It feels very... I can't think of the correct word to describe it, but you feel like you're you feel like you're part of the driving experience. You feel like you're one with the car. And that is something that you don't find in many vehicles these days. And I've driven with you on the new ones. And there there's a couple of new ones I really like, but mm-hmm. You know, I'm addicted to these Gen 1s. And yeah. It's just, well, know, see, the Gen 1s yeah. didn't have all the technology. No. They didn't have the driving mode thing. They didn't have all this other stuff to make it work correctly. You didn't need power seats. You didn't need you didn't need any of that. You had raw power coming out of that little tiny supercharged engine. You didn't need anything else. It was great the way it was. And this one is fantastic. Now... I don't really not like. I don't really care too much usually for the analog speedometer because all my speedometers are digital, and most of my most of my minis and every mini I've driven, I've had a digital readout in front of me. But the numbers are nice and big and legible on here, and it's a smaller speedometer. It's not that gigantic dinner plate that you see on the second gen ones or second gen mini. So it's easier to read. You know that this is 30, 50, 60, 70. You know where they are because you can actually see it a lot bigger. This was a smaller vehicle from an interior perspective. It was definitely a smaller car. The newer ones seem seem bigger. And in fact, they are a little bit bigger when you look at them correctly. But it's just... It's just... Um, there's just something about this car. When people ask me why I like it so well. It's, it's, it equates to... This is like a P40. The newer minis are like an F-16. I prefer the P-40s because you really fly that airplane. Yeah. It's it's not so electronic, and uh, the feel is just great. I mean, when you're driving a first-gen, you really feel like you're part of the car. I mean, I feel like I'm part of the car when I'm driving any mini because because I I usually drive stick shift. But I like the feel of the first-gens when it comes to that. It just feels very raw as it were it's such an interesting little car <laughs> oh, I love it it's music to my ears who needs a radio when you have yeah, that exactly who needs a rate in the first gen minis? Who really needs a radio when you have a supercharger in the front and pops and burbles at the rear? You don't need one. You really don't need one. This is just music. This is just whipping your head back music as it launches down the road and then pops and crackles like crazy out the back. They're just fun little cars. Like I've said before of several Minis I've driven, you cannot have a bad day when you're driving a Mini. (laughs) What's the smile on your face? It's just impossible to have a bad day when you're driving one. I've been very blessed to to find really two good Minis. You know, um, my JCW is just perfect. And this is a great car, and I think this was going to be a great car, too. And it's just, it's almost like fishing. You know, you keep looking, mm-hmm. keep looking, and looking, and eventually you find the one you want at the price you want to pay. And I mean, yes, yeah. you may encounter a couple thousand. It might need a couple thousand yeah. in some work on this car over time. But for what you paid for it, and I'm not going to tell you all what he paid for it, but he got a really good deal on this car. For what you paid for it, you got a lot of car for the money. It was, it, was a good, it was a good deal. Yes, it doesn't have a sunroof. Yes, it doesn't have heated seats. But it has everything else. It has the automatic climate control. It has some bells and whistles. It's a very, very well thought out, very, very good little car. Next one. And I'm very, very pleased with how this thing drives. I really like it. There's a few little quirks that I didn't notice before, but I guess it's because I haven't been in a, in a first-gen Mini for a while. So there's a few things in this car that I didn't notice. But anywho, back to the studio. Perfect. 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 
I know I said back to the studio, but did you really think I was going to turn down a chance to drive a 2006 John Cooper Works? The answer is no. We have bigger grins on this one so far. I know. And we haven't that, even got to the highway yet. We haven't even got to the highway yet. This one just this one seems more fun. I think it's because it has oh I don't know, it has John Cooper works on the back of it. So this is the one with the tuning kit, right? Yes. Yeah. And was this factory or dealer installed? Yes. Okay, so we don't know exactly if it was factory or dealer installed. But this is just so far. I like it. Now, we added the different filter in the airbox. Yeah, we put that other filter that had, like, the valve or something yeah. in it, yeah. which is kind of cool. But I like this. I really like this. I think there's it's a controversy who, who actually installed that kit. Some of the people at the dealership said, oh, yeah, we installed that. But that was, you know, a long time ago. And well, see, you could find yeah. out. You could find out simple. Yeah. Just have them run the VIN, and they'll figure it. They'll get the yeah. build sheet for the car. Yeah, and somebody else said, oh, it was, it was assembled in Oxford. So we'll see. <laughs> I could listen to that all day. <sighs> but it still feels like a new car. I know. This car is 14 years old and has 27,000 miles on it. It still smells new. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to get me one of these, too. Now, finding a low mileage R53 under 30,000 miles, what is that, the equivalent of like finding the Holy Grail? Pretty much. It's next to impossible. And it's British Racing Green. And it's British Racing Green, exactly. sound that unmistakable supercharger sound you just want to get out on the road and floor it but we're stuck behind a concrete truck so I can't really floor it right now and there's a police car driving by so flooring it would be impossible what do you think about the response of this car as well as this, the new one this the response one. in this car is actually better yeah it's like instantaneous. I mean, it's instantaneous in the other one, but the other one, it feels more raw, almost classic car-like. Whereas this one, it feels like I'm driving a brand new Mini. They feel very different. The thing about the supercharged Mini is it has instantaneous torque, as I'm going to now demonstrate. I didn't have to downshift to overtake. Oh, but I love that supercharger. Just hit the accelerator so you can hear it go. <laughs> and this one has stickers on it, so it's obviously faster. Well, yes, that's a given. Stickers equal horsepower. Right. <laughs> but we will fix that. <laughs> but this has about 210 horsepower, give or take. So it's higher horsepower over any first gen Mini. Because the average first gen Mini had between 162 and 168 horsepower, depending on model. This one has about 200. So, or more, to, or more than 200. I think it was 210. But that is just ridiculous on such a little car. The car weighs like 2,600 pounds with 210 horsepower, so horsepower per ton is insane.
love this. This is awesome. <laughs> Anywho, we're going to slow back down. We're going a little fast. But yeah, I love this. This is great. So you got, so you all got two R53s for the price of one. So you're welcome. Now back to the studio. Okay, so the last step that you should do when you take two. Okay, so the last step that I would recommend with a take two. Take three. I always say take two. Okay. okay, so the last step that you should do when purchasing a new R50. Damn. Okay, the last thing you should do when you purchase an R53 is bring it somewhere to have somebody who look at it, who knows what they're doing, who's old school, has maybe an R53 themselves. Is that right, Zach? Yes. That's what I'm saying. I knew you were going to say that, so I'm just saying it for you. So, yes. You know, I'm taking it to my favorite exactly. place to come and have that because I know the guy who works on it is, is an old school guy and he knows it. And he's going to look at it inside and out, upside down, and so forth to tell us exactly what we need for maintenance and upkeep and then you know see what happens down the road right Zach? yep so anyway i hope you enjoyed this video go check out some of my first gen mini videos on the playlist at the end of this video and before i let you go i'm just going to remind you all that life is too short to drive a boring car drive a mini see y'all next time <laughs>